Do you have ongoing sleep issues? Maybe you're having trouble falling asleep or staying asleep or a little bit of both. My name is Dr. Taranella, and in this video, we're going to look at some of the themes with sleep issues. And through looking at those themes, we're going to look at how to resolve sleep issues. As I said, my name is Dr. Taranella, and I make these videos to help you go beyond basic health. It's not made for any specific individual. So please read this video disclaimer before we get into the video details. <laughs> So in this video, we're going to look at how to resolve sleep issues. And of course, there's lots of different reasons why people might have sleep issues. And if you're having ongoing sleep problems, there's some really kind of more basic things that should be done to improve your sleep before looking at some of these more detailed reasons and problems. But I'm not going to cover those here except to say that you should look at sleep hygiene and how to optimize those things first and foremost. All right. So when I'm looking at how to resolve sleep issues, the first thing I like to do is kind of put it into different categories. Do you have trouble falling asleep? Do you have trouble staying asleep? Or do you have a little bit of both? And most of the time people have more so one or the other, meaning they have more of a problem staying asleep than falling asleep or vice versa. And that's just helpful to know because I think about those problems in different ways meaning there's different mechanisms typically that are going on that trigger each of those problems. And sometimes there is some overlap, of course. So we are going to talk about both in a little bit of detail in this video. But before we get into that, I just wanted to mention that sometimes they have more than one thing going on. And sometimes you have to layer multiple things together in order to get the full improvement or change in your sleep quality that you're looking for. You may get a little bit of improvement from one thing and then you layer another thing and you get more improvement from that. All right. So first let's look at the issue with trouble falling asleep. So with this, most people report that they have trouble like turning off their brain and it's usually from a neurotransmitter perspective, it's likely an underlying cause is high stimulating neurotransmitters. There's higher amounts of those in your brain and it just keeps going on a loop focused on something in particular from work or from a conversation that you had or something that you've been thinking about a lot lately. So there's some obvious reasons for this and some not so obvious reasons for this. Caffeine intake and stimulating medications too close to bedtime are going to definitely increase the amount of these types of neurotransmitters in your body. For some people, this could also go with exercise too close to bedtime or even hanging out with friends too close to bedtime. It may cause you to not be able to shut off your brain, those conversations or that activity is still kind of like sitting with you. And with regard to caffeine, you may be surprised to know that some people drink cup of coffee at or some sort of caffeinated beverage at 3 or 4 p.m. and they wonder why they're waking up at 2 or 3 a.m. and they can't fall back to sleep or better yet they can't fall asleep initially. All drugs, medications including caffeine have a certain half-life which means the amount of time it takes for half of that substance to get eliminated out of your body. So for caffeine, it's going to range. Everyone's slightly different in how their enzymes work, but it may be anywhere from five to seven hours. So if you take that caffeine at 12 p.m., that means half of it's going to be out of your system at five or seven p.m. And for some people, that could be a few hours before they're going to bed. And so if they had 100 milligrams of caffeine at 12 o'clock, there's still 50 milligrams when they're going to sleep. Now they may be able to fall asleep, but it's still kind of in their system. So they may pass over some of the stages of sleep quicker than they otherwise would and not get as restful or deep of sleep. Of course, some people are more efficient at breaking caffeine down and they may think that because they're able to fall asleep really quickly, it's not affecting them, but that would be a mistake. Now, let's say you're one of those people and you're breaking down the caffeine fairly quickly, say it takes you about four hours to break down half of that caffeine and you drink your last cup at around 3 p.m., well, half of that's still in your system at seven and still going to be in your system later that evening when you may be sleeping at 11 p.m. So these are some things to keep in mind when you're choosing how, what type of caffeine to drink especially when you have ongoing sleep issues. I've had people make this one single adjustment and had a really big impact on their sleep quality. Of course, it's not always that simple. And it's good to mention just in case, sometimes just adjusting the cutoff time by one hour, 30 minutes can make a significant change. So as I mentioned, we're all slightly different in how we break down 
different neurotransmitters and different chemicals, medications, caffeine in our body. And because of that, some of us have more trouble with breaking down the stimulating neurotransmitters in our bodies as well. But there's things that we can do to enhance how our bodies break those things down. So for example, there's the COMT gene alteration. COMT stands for catechol O-methyltransferase, and it's a enzyme that breaks down catecholamines. These are things like dopamine, histamine, epinephrine, norepinephrine, and similar amine-type molecules. These are all very stimulating to the brain. They wake us up. They help us focus. And if you're curious more about this particular gene, you can look at some of my other videos on COMT gene alteration. It actually spans a lot of different topics and subjects. So back to the issue at hand, which is more about sleep. So with this gene alteration, there's going to be a slight slowdown or sometimes a significant slowdown in how the enzyme is functioning. And with that slowdown, there's going to be a buildup of the neurotransmitters because the enzyme is breaking them down into things that are less stimulating. And if it's not working, you get a buildup of those neurotransmitters. With that buildup, those neurotransmitters are then able to activate the brain in a way that keeps it awake and not able to fall asleep. So providing the cofactors for that enzyme and cofactors are things that basically just help the enzyme work the way that it should. And if you don't have enough of the cofactor, that enzyme isn't going to work in an efficient way. So making sure your body has sufficient amounts of that cofactor can really make sure that the functionality of the enzyme that's there, even though it's slowed down, it's going to work as efficiently as possible. In this case, magnesium is one of those cofactors and using specific types of magnesium, you can see the description for one that we use in Trust, and it can be really helpful at eliminating some of these neurotransmitters. Now, what a lot of my patients find is that this helps them fall asleep. And it's not going to knock you out and immediately go to sleep, but it's going to help you shorten that time that it takes for you to fall asleep. Now, you don't necessarily need a gene test or figure out if you have this COMT enzyme in order for it to work. This pattern of improvement with magnesium typically works for those people that are having more trouble falling asleep. So if it takes you more than 30 minutes or so to fall asleep, there's a good chance that this is going to help you shorten that window. And this is especially true if it's been with you for a good chunk of your life, meaning like you've always had trouble falling asleep even since you were a teenager or a young adult. That being said, magnesium can help regardless of this as a ongoing thing or a new thing. Even in the case that you're dealing with some situational stress, it can definitely help you fall asleep because, again, it's helping that COMT enzyme do its job. And a lot of people are deficient in magnesium anyways, so it's going to help, especially in cases where you can't fall asleep. The second thing I wanted to address with regard to resolving sleep issues is waking up in the middle of the night. This is often attributed to higher cortisol levels. And I do find this to be the case in a lot of my patients, but tracking and treating high cortisol isn't always easy. Sometimes it is, and that's what we're going to focus on in this video, the easy ways to lower cortisol and improve your sleep quality and reduce the frequency of waking up. So cortisol is a hormone that's produced during fight or flight situations. So acute stress, physical, psychological, cortisol levels are going to go up and there's a corresponding rise in glucose. This occurs to help mobilize the body to get away from whatever that stressor is. The classic is the saber-toothed tiger or some sort of physical stressor. However, for psychological stress, and specifically if you're sleeping, you don't really have anywhere to go, and this doesn't really help that much. So if this sounds like it describes you and your situation, there are some herbal things that can help with lowering or minimizing cortisol levels. One is called ashwagandha, and ashwagandha works like an adaptogen. You can also think of it like a weak agonist, and it can increase the activity of cortisol when cortisol is low and it reduce cortisol activity when cortisol is high. Check out the description for one that I typically use. Another more potent product that can be used to help reduce cortisol levels and sometimes stress levels is called phosphatidylserine. 
This product can work by reducing the cortisol levels, and it tends to be more sedating and relaxing in general. It's a natural occurring phospholipid, so it's part of our body's cell membrane structure, as all our cells are made up of phospholipids, but this particular phospholipid is called phosphatidylserine. And you can see the description for products that we use, but basically that's going to help reduce your cortisol levels throughout your body when you take it for a period of time. Outside of psychological stressors or physical stressors, anything that alters your blood sugar level in a significant way can also make your cortisol levels rise too. Now, it's not going to happen right away, but it's going to happen as your blood sugar drops. Cortisol is going to kick in to raise that blood sugar again. And that's one reason why it's important to avoid sugary foods, in particular alcohol, before going to bed. This can throw off your blood sugar, and even if you don't actually wake up, you're going to be in a lighter sleep and not allow you to stay in those deeper stages and sometimes not even get into the deeper stages of sleep because the cortisol is kind of keeping you slightly awake all the time. Now, if you start to change your diet to improve your blood sugar levels, it's not going to improve your sleep right away. Sometimes it's going to take weeks, months to see those improvements. Using some kind of tracking system for your blood sugar or your sleep can be really helpful for these cases as well. This topic on cortisol and blood sugar is something that I'm going to address in a upcoming video on what causes trouble staying asleep. I'm going to look at some of the research behind this and some of the broader implications. All right, that's all I had to discuss on this topic, how to resolve sleep issues. If you do have questions on this topic, drop them in the comment section. I'll do my best to answer your question. If you need or want a more customized, useful answer, consider joining the membership program. We'll have more time and attention to address your question. Either way, I'll try and answer your question. Thanks again for watching. We'll see you next time.